All right, before we start this interview, let me tell you a little bit about who Robert Dietz is, and then we'll play that interview for, for you guys. So Robert Dietz is a chief economist for the NAHB, where he leads a team of 12 economists whose responsibilities include forecasts of housing and economic trends, survey research, and home building industry and policy analysis. Dr. Dietz has published academic research on the private and social benefits of home ownership, federal tax expenditure estimation, and other housing topics. He is the nation's leading analyst of the residential construction industry. Dr. Dietz has testified before the House Ways and Means Committee, the Senate's Finance Committee, and the Senate Banking Subcommittee on Economic Policy on Housing, Economic and Tax Issues. He is a member of the Blue Chip Wall Street Journal and other top national forecasting panels, has co-chaired the National Association for Business Economics Construction Real Estate Group, and is commonly cited on CNBC, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and NPR. Prior to joining NAHB in 2005, Robert worked as an economist for the Congressional Joint Committee on Taxation, where he estimated the federal budget impact of tax law changes associated with housing and real estate issues. He is a native of Dayton, Ohio, attended George Washington University as an undergraduate and earned a PhD in economics from the Ohio State University in 2003. Let me just say, he knows what he's talking about and he knows it well. Yeah, it's amazing that he was able to take the time and do this interview with us. He's such a busy guy. Very busy. Uh, matter of fact, I mean, it's it's almost every week you'll see him on some national news channel, Fox News, CM, CNN, CNBC. They cite him all the time, and he comes on there, and you can go to YouTube, search his name, and you'll see all of his interviews talking about this market. And obviously, probably more so than normal because of what we went through last year and what we're in the effects we're having this year. So he's very active and very busy. So I can't say enough how thankful for, that I am that he took the time to come on here and speak to us. That is awesome. All right, let's get on to this interview. I hope you guys enjoy it. Take notes and you can always come back and watch this after the live show. Thanks for coming on the Advantage Live show. I'm excited to have this conversation with you because I know in real estate and especially in the building sector, we went through some crazy stuff in 2020 and it has made this year kind of interesting to say the least. So um, I know we're prepared to ask you some questions because I know you've got some information for our audience to hear and it's gonna be amazing help for us. So Rob, without further ado, let's go straight into these conversations. So the inventory is short. Um, so how large is this deficit in the US and, and why does it even exist currently? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the kind of the key features of housing over the last 10, 15 years. We, we knew there was demographic demand headed our way, particularly the millennials entering their, their first time home buyer years. But we have to go back to the consequences of the Great Recession itself to examine why there is a housing deficit in the country. Now, there's a great Freddie Mac analysis that they published. Uh, they actually did a couple of different versions over the last couple of years, but uh, they estimate that we're short maybe three and a half million single family homes nationwide. And, and the consequences of that, of course, are lower vacancy rates. Uh, and then you've got a much reduced share of young adults who are independent householders. In other words, the share of young adults who are living with their parents has actually doubled over oh, the wow. last 20 years. So, you know, from, from my side of the industry uh, here, at, and I run the, the economics group at the, the National Association of Home Builders, all we do is focus on housing supply. You know, our friends yes. at, the, at the realtors and, and other organizations look at the demand side uh, in great detail. And you know, over the last four to five years, in terms of the lack of home building, I've attributed it, this deficit of housing that we see to what we've called the the five L's. It's a it's a lack of labor. It's a lack of land that's available to build on. A lack of lending. Uh, to uh, builders, uh, lumber, which is a, a key challenge uh, right now, and then laws and, and regulatory burdens, and particularly in terms of zoning. And there's no silver bullet. All, all these factors are at play. And the result is uh, there's slightly different causes in every uh, market. But if you talk to builders and remodelers, they will attribute their inability to grow in a huge way in a given year, uh, the amount of housing supply we add to the market, to those factors. So we need to work on them. 
uh, in order to add that much needed inventory. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's, that explains it in very good detail. Honestly, that's, that's really interesting to see. Cause I mean, that's, that's what we're seeing, right? Inventory shortage, absolutely. The building supplies and all of that. So now home, home building jumped in 2020 and it looks to grow again in 2021. So, and I know this has pushed all those lumber material uh, prices up and cost way up. So let's discuss a little bit on what's driving those prices up and how that's set us up to the market that we're in. Yeah, so with that housing deficit, and, and, and keep in mind, in, uh, in, in 2020, we built about a, a million single family homes. That was a 12% a gain over uh, 2019. That was a, a pretty oh, small a, growth rate. Yeah. Keep in mind all the, the demand side, the fact that we had that deficit. Uh, we had historically low interest rates. I mean, it's low point, a 2.7% a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. So you had all this sudden demand for construction materials. And it came from the remodeling market as well. Remodeling was up about uh, 7% last year as people invested in their homes to add space and you know, had kids studying it at home, working at home, exercising at home. We, we took a lot of economic activity that occurred in the commercial real estate sector and moved it into the residential sector. So housing mm -hmm. acted as additional productive capital. Um, but the consequences of that, of course, are higher material prices. And we've been watching lumber prices over the last year. Uh, these are really kind of shocking numbers. We, we started lumber pricing uh, back in mid-April of 2020 at a more normalized $350 per thousand board feet. That's how we, we measure okay. pricing. Today, at the end of May, the beginning of June of 2021, lumber pricing is now at about $1,500 per thousand board feet. That's an increase wow. of more than 330% in just a little more than, than 12 months. So what are, what are the consequences of that? Well, for a typical builder, it's adding about $36,000 to a typical newly built home. That's about a, a 2,600 square foot house. And for apartments, by the way, it's adding about $13,000, which translates into a rent increase of about $120 a month. My goodness. Yeah. And, and the scary thing <laughs> is that is just lumber. It's not just lumber. In fact, appliances are in short supply. We know the, the economy has a number of, of bottlenecks and, and, and supply shortages, but all of these things combined are making it more expensive to build housing and it's taking longer because those materials aren't necessarily showing up at the work site. So, you know, whether it's it's realtors or, or buyers in the market, I, I know there's frustration about that lack of supply. And unfortunately, we do think that those those challenges are going to persist into uh, next year. Well, that's that's interesting. I think going back to the very beginning of your your statement here and thinking through this, I, I can't think of a market where we had low interest rate, good job growth, um, a building and the renovation market all converging at the exact same time. And then you insert the pandemic, right? It's like, what a weird makeup this is. And, and I know a lot of people have made statements like, oh, is this anything like 2005 and 2006? You know, I, we hear a lot about that, but that was a little bit different than what we saw. I mean, to be honest, I mean, again, it's a completely different market. So what's your projection as far as like how long this will process and like what kind of where we're going from here? Like what, what's, what's that look like? Yeah, I mean, it, there is a lot of discussion about how this compares to 2005, 2006. I think we have to be clear, you, you had a lot of building, you had a lot of demand there, but a lot of that demand was being driven by loose underwriting. There was a yeah. speculative frenzy as, as people use homes for investments. That's not what's driving home prices up 10, 11, 12% year over year right now. Demand is mostly organic. In other words, it's being driven by demographics. And you know, again, keep in mind that the home building numbers this year, we expect uh, at least a 10% growth rate. So we had 12% okay. last year. That'll push us to about 1.1 million single family starts. Now that's gonna be the best year since the Great Recession. We probably need to be building about 1.2 million single family homes a year just to keep up with demographics, second home demand and replace homes that are removed from the housing stock. So we're not looking at those 1.8 million single family starts of that under overbuilding that we saw 
uh, a, a decade ago. So our, our outlook is that, yes, interest rates are going to rise. Uh, economic growth this year in terms of GDP growth is going to be the best since 1984. Higher growth rates and a reopened economy all means more demand for capital and investment. That means interest rates are going to move higher. So this is likely to be a somewhat quicker cycle where you have those low rates last year and then moving into a higher rate period. And then we'll have to watch the Federal Reserve. Because uh, they're, yes. They have a twofold objective, right? They want to heal the labor market. That's what we're doing right now. We're going to get below probably a 5% unemployment rate. Uh, this year, we, we had a 3.5% yeah. unemployment rate in 2019, a great economy. Yeah. But at some point, they're going to have to tighten up policy. And the way they're going to do that they're going to announce a tapering of uh, mortgage-backed security purchases mm. later this year. And we think then in 2023, they'll begin to raise rates. Okay. Our concern would be once you see mortgage interest rates get up above about 4%, which doesn't sound particularly <laughs> high compared to the 90s or the 80s, but yeah. up above 4%, you will see some housing demand move the sideline. That will cool down some of the home price growth and get us back to a more sustainable market. And that's really what we want to see. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I think when everyone's starting to make money and as things increase into that level, it's it's a lot easier for builders to get back out and start building. It's easier for people to start selling because the jobs are adjusting. We need to see that. Um, that's a more stable market. Um, so I, that's a good, good outlook, honestly. Um, I, I I could see that absolutely the case. Um, let's, let's, let's go, let's transition a little bit into like the remodeling market, um, like how it's performing. Cause I, here's the funny thing is, you know, obviously COVID hit and, you know, everyone's at home and, you know, my wife is like pretty much redesigned the house to the point where she's now wanting to get tools and start <laughs> building. So we went to get supplies and of course they're either, they're not there or they're super expensive, but, but so how is that industry itself performing? It's it's actually doing great. Uh, I mean, we had a seven percent gain last year. Our forecast for this year is actually even stronger. Still, we think the overall remodeling market will be up nine uh, percent. Uh, what we have found in our research over the last twenty years is that a lot of remodeling occurs when a home is either put on the market to be purchased or right after it's actually bought by a new buyer. So there's a lot of uh, rehab type work that goes into place. So as existing home inventory increases, and we do expect that to happen this year, uh, we'll watch the uh, the NAR data, for example, but as the economy reopens and, and more and more people feel comfortable putting their homes on the market, that too will increase the demand for remodeling. The other factor, and this goes back to what we were talking about before, the fact that we had about you know 10 years of underbuilding means that the homes that are in the stock are older. And in mm -hmm. fact, we have an aging housing stock. The, the typical age of a single family home uh, in, in the United States right now is getting real close to age 40. Uh, oh, wow. Homes do last 60, 80, and in some cases, 100 years. But you know, as they enter that that second half of their lives, just like people, <laughs> they, they need additional <laughs> work. Um, so. Uh, whether it's aging in place, both the home and the household, uh, trying to increase energy efficiency, or as you said, making kind of those those uh, stylistic type changes, structural changes to use the home more efficiently, all that is driving housing demand. And I'll I'll, I'll mention from my own perspective, we're we're trying to finish an attic in a mm. townhouse in the Washington D.C. area, oh, try to maybe on. add a, a bedroom. And it's been really tough, despite the fact knowing a lot of people in the industry, to get a remodeler to come out and give us a price quote because they're so busy in Northern Virginia. That, that's interesting. We're having the same problem trying to remodel an office, and you, it, you can't find the work because, again, materials and everything else is just it's just delaying everything. So that's great. Yeah, um, you know, before we move on to the next question, I, I had this kind of thought pop in my mind. It's like. What kind of changes have you guys begun to see in the building style of homes? Because like I know in the real estate market, it's like all of a sudden we started getting our clients asking us questions like, hey, we need this private office. We need this gym or we need the now we need school rooms. And do you see the industry itself, the building industry kind of changing a little bit in the what type of homes are being built and even remodeled? There's definitely been some design changes. And then there's more of the construction technology type issues. On the design change we're seeing in the preference data and builders are definitely telling us 
Uh, the idea of not just a single home office, but maybe an additional room that can double as a second home office is becoming an almost must need uh, within mm. new construction. Uh, space concerns, storage concerns are an issue not only for, for baby boomers, but millennials. Americans just simply uh, have, have more stuff. And we actually saw a renewed focus on the exterior of the home, exterior oh. amenities. So whether this is the outdoor grill or play space, and I think that's just a natural consequence of 2020 itself, whether it's staycations or just using your home uh, for more purposes. The other thing is the, the geography of home building. Uh, we oh. definitely saw in 2020, because people were working at home, they weren't doing that commute into the urban core five days a week. And we don't think they're gonna be doing that in the future as well. We think 30 to 40% of households are probably only gonna go in the office maybe three, four days a week. Yeah. The result is, if you think about the commute from a weekly rather than a daily mm -hmm. perspective, people can vote with their feet and shop further out within a metro area. And that has driven a home building boom out in the exurbs and the outer suburbs of medium sized cities. In fact, the lowest cost and the lowest density areas are the areas where we see the greatest growth uh, home construction. So it, it kind of gets wow. back to again what we were talking about before, which is we've been underbuilding. So a lot of people said, well, what technology type changes can we see that would make home building more efficient. The, the, the old joke that fusion power is always 20 years away. Yeah. There's some sort of discussion of building more of the home in a factory, this kind of modular and panelized construction, not mobile home construction, which we, we call ma manufactured housing, but traditional foundation built housing, but where most of it's built in the factory. There's a lot of discussion of it. It seems to show up in the Wall Street Journal and CNBC every quarter. Interesting. So you're 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 talking kind of like the Sears homes in a way. Yeah. Is that very similar to what they used to do back in the was that the 40s, 30s Maybe and 40s, 30s and 40s built housing. Yeah, we panelized construction where the frames itself are built, so kind of like trusses. About 80 percent okay. are built in the factory, but two dimensional where the frames are built in the factory and then assembled the worksite or modular where it's basically hmm. three dimensional construction in the factory and either the whole house or components of the house are basically assembled by a crane at the work site. Now wow. the argument is if you do that in the factory, you're gonna get an economy of scale uh, that, you know, like like with car manufacturing and that'll reduce gotcha. the, the problem is home construction occurs over a huge geography, right? And we're typically building in places where people don't live yet. The result is that you don't have a whole lot of that kind of construction. In fact, in recent years, it's only been about 3% of single family home building. And 20 years ago, it was seven or 8%. So, Oh, wow. So we went down. It went down. And, and it's really shocking. And it has a lot to do with the fact that the geography of where we're building homes has changed a lot. I a lot see. It's moved from the Midwest and the Northeast, places where those factories were located, like Pennsylvania. Uh, and, and move to places where the factories aren't located. So the transportation costs go up. So I think the share of that kind of housing is going to go up maybe five to 7%, but it's not a game changer. We need to get back to addressing those five L's, including recruiting people into the construction labor force. And I, mm. I think, by the way, that's one of the big changes that coming in addition to commuting. People are going to begin to find different ways to train for jobs beyond the four-year degree. And we'll have to watch some of these big tech companies if they start offering designations that compete oh. with a bachelor degree oh yeah don't require huge student loan payments and all that would be good for housing and i think we're likely to see some of that occur in construction as well man that's a great insight you know to be honest I, you know we were actually having this conversation i have a 14 year old son and we were sitting there talking about just jobs and stuff like that you know he's thinking through you know he's still kind of young but right. but he you know he's like you know dad it's like what could i do you know, in my life, that would be a job that technology would aid, but not replace. Right. And it's like, oh, dude, trade, the trade. any kind of trade job. I mean, th those jobs are going to always have to have people and there's not a lot of people entering that. Um, so there is an opportunity there. Um, man, yeah. I, and to own your own business. That's the other thing. Yeah. I think we're going to see with this kind of notion of the gig economy, which right now is more on, you know, working on demand or controlling your own schedule is going to expand. So you've got more people owning their own labor by owning their own firms. Yeah, yeah that's good. That's really good. Um, so young kids watching. <laughs> there you go. Get into the building industry in some form or fashion. I mean, I agree. I, I think that's really, really good. 
So, okay, let's talk policy a little bit. So we know that we got an inventory problem. I mean, we need more inventory, we need more homes. So what can we do to increase the housing supply? What's some things that we need to be um, looking at and trying to do? Yeah, so go back to those five L's. Uh, you gotta address each of them. Uh, the, again, no silver bullets, but uh, we need to find ways to get people into, uh, for example, in labor, uh, we can use the community college uh, system. We can use uh, groups like the Home Builders Institute that trains people uh, and brings them into the industry. So encouraging that kind of training, uh, we know we have a historic number of open jobs right now in the yeah. economy. And unfortunately, some of that's gonna mean restructuring some of the support systems we enacted last year, including reducing the expanded unemployment insurance benefits to create this kind of more mis uh, the mismatch that exists right now, fix that mismatch between open jobs and people looking for jobs. Mm. Some of that though is a parenting challenge. We gotta get the public schools back <laughs> open in person so more people can be out there looking for work. And I think within construction and housing in particular, trying to reform zoning rules, uh, reducing mm. exclusionary zoning requirements like minimum lot sizes that basically require you to use too much land to build housing, that hurts and holds inventory down. And then if we get to the number one uh, short-term issue right now, that's building materials, uh, we, we simply do not produce enough lumber in the United States. So getting a new softwood lumber agreement with Canada is critical. And yes. It's hard to believe, but with that fifteen hundred dollars per thousand board feet in lumber pricing, we actually have a tariff of nine percent on Canadian lumber. That's something they do quite well. And uh, right now, there's a proposal from the administrative side that would double that to eighteen percent. We've got crazy lumber prices. There's what? actually a proposal in place. It's bureaucratic. It's a oh yeah. Judicial. So it's not being driven by you know, politics or policy concerns, but it would double it. So we need policymakers to take some leadership here. Yes. Say, Look, we need we need twofold. We need to increase domestic lumber production, more sawmills, more competition in that space, uh, and then we need to find ways to move to more free trade when it comes to materials. And uh, you know, we're we're talking about a big infrastructure bill. You're not going to build that infrastructure unless you have construction workers and building materials. And those are two <laughs> of the shortest supply items in the U.S. economy right now. So there are some concerns about as we continue to pour mon money in the economy that we're basically mm. risking some persistent inflation in the years ahead. Wow. I think that's a great observation, um, especially the fact that we're charging tariffs on imported materials when we're trying to build and we need those materials so as far as like what all the materials, I, would you say Canada is where we get a lot of our wood? Is that where the majority of our wood comes from then? Yeah. When you look at the, the total amount of, say, softwood lumber, which is the structural lumber for frames of the home, uh, a, a little more than two thirds is domestically produced. Uh, about 30 percent comes from Canada and there's a, a single digit percent that comes from other countries like uh, in, in Europe. So. 30% coming from Canada, that's a significant amount. And we're, we're taxing ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, now, part of the justification for those tariffs is that you increase domestic production. Local production, think, okay. Unfortunately, over the last four or five years, what we've seen is not much increase in domestic production at all. So, you know, Adam Smith, you know, basically told us, when <laughs> you don't produce enough domestically, you use trade to offset that, that effect. And then we can create jobs in the United States in terms of the construction industry, the financial industry, the realtor industry, in terms of adding to housing supply. And that's where you get the, the big bang economic impact from housing. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, and, it, and I think we're at that phase now where we've got to start changing the mindset of Americans in general, get back to work, yep. like start going to get these jobs that are available to you and start working and, and let's do this. I mean, let's, 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 let's make our own products the best we can and yep. then work with our fellow countries, you know? That's right. And I, I think there's been a lot of focus on the unemployment rate as we, we move into 2021. But, you know, for from the labor market perspective, you look at that labor force participation rate at, at the mm -hmm. end of 2019, it was 63 percent. Today, it's below 62 percent. Now, it doesn't sound like oh, a wow. big drop, but it represents several million people who aren't even looking for work that were, say, a year and a half ago. So finding mm -hmm. ways to help people come out of this uh, you know, economic downturn, this kind of really artificial downturn, but encouraging them to be looking for work at the same time, I think is the key policymaking challenge of 2021. All right. That's good. 
Rob, I want to say thank you for coming on. Uh, this has been really good information. I know the audience is really going to appreciate it. It's very helpful and very, very relevant. Um, and I really, really do appreciate it. And you're welcome back anytime. If you ever Great. have anything else you want to bring, come back and share your wisdom, But my friend. Happy to. And good to join you here today. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it.